Like many people in the world, I am a dad. So, more often than not, I find myself doing things now that I never really used to do. Well, not for a long time anyway. And one of the things on that list is watching kids' TV shows. My daughter is a little over a year old now, so she's still trying to decide which show's her favourite. And because she's her father's daughter, one of those shows is Thomas the Tank Engine. One episode we've just watched is called Toby's Tightrope, and this one really stuck out to me. In this episode, all sorts of craziness happens. With huge torrents of water, bridges collapsing, brakes failing, you name it, it's all there. But there was one shot in particular that stuck out to me. And it's this shot right here that had me thinking, I wonder if I could make that. So like with most of my builds, I start off with a photo frame for the base. I like to use photo frames just because they're cheap and it saves me making a base out of timber. All it needs is a little tidy up with some sandpaper and then I can go ahead and stick down a chunk of packing foam to give me a nice uniform base to work with. I tidied up the foam off camera on the hot wire cutter and then had a look at some reference material. The original layouts and models built for the show in the early 90s were about 1 to 30 second scale. That's pretty big. And because I didn't really want this piece to take up my whole workbench, I decided to go with N-Gage. So if you really think about it, this is just going to be a miniature, miniature diorama. So once I was happy with the rough layout of the land and the placement of my bridge, I could start to build up the landforms using some XPS foam. I just cut a couple of pieces with the hot wire foam cutter to follow the markings on the base. Then I could test fit my makeshift bridge abutments and make sure I was happy with the height of the track before locking everything into place with a little hot glue. And this time around I decided to build up the sides of the diorama with single pieces of foam. Sometimes this can be a little bit easier than carving out big chunks of foam awkwardly with the hot wire cutter. Plus, it doesn't make quite so much mess. So after lots of cutting and gluing, I was left with this weird packing foam hamster house that needed some more foam to be removed to give it a more natural looking shape. So after marking out a few sections, I used the hot wire foam cutter to remove any unwanted foam. Then I was left with something that looked a little less like a pet rodent's house and more like the beginnings of a diorama. But I was left with some dead space that needed to be filled in. So for that job, I decided to use some craft paper. So once I got that out of my system, I balled up a few strips of the paper and used it to fill the gaps. Then it was a case of just locking it all down using a good quality masking tape. The tape's not only going to help hold everything in place, but it's also going to give me a good base to start building up the landscape. Then it was on to arguably the most boring part of any of my builds, fitting the fascia. And if you have seen any of my other builds, you'll know that I like to use polypropylene sheet stuck in place with some double sided tape. It's a simple but pretty effective way of getting a nice clean finish on all four sides. And once that job was out of the way, I could have a quick tidy up of my workbench before moving on to the next step, which was to mix up a batch of sculptor mould to start to build up the landscape. There's not really a lot to go wrong with this step, it's just a case of mixing it into a fairly thick paste and slapping it all over the model before smoothing it out with your fingers. And while the sculptor mould is still wet, I can use it to stick down some larger rocks in the riverbed. The rocks that I'm using here are just decorative stones that I picked up from a garden centre. They all just get pushed into place and then blended into the sculptor mould with an old brush. Then I make sure to smooth out the riverbed as much as possible and give it all about 24 hours of drying time. 
The next day, once everything was dry, I could then move on to add in a few layers of texture. So I cracked out my rock box and decided to go with some fallen rocks from Geek Game and Scenics. I like to use these for things like riverbeds because most of them are pretty smooth. I start by coating the riverbed with a layer of matte mod podge. This is just going to help hold some of the larger stones in place. I then follow that up with some coarse ballast from Woodland Scenics and some fine sand. Then this all gets locked into place with a few drops of isopropyl alcohol and some scenic cement. Then after a few hours of dry time, I was finally ready to start putting down some paint. I started by hitting everything with a black primer through the airbrush and then moved on to a light grey to give all the rocks a highlight. Then I could start to build up some colour in the rocks with some acrylic washes. I started with a fairly dark grey before moving on to a few brown tones. Whilst trying to be careful of any loose stones. Then I picked out a few of the individual rocks with a lighter stony beige colour. Then I blended all of the surface of the riverbed together with some more dark brown and a few hints of green. This all then got tied together with a final black wash and a very light dry brush with some off-white just to give a few highlights. And now all the rocks were painted, I could move on to the dirt texture. I like to use this dark earth texture paste from AK Interactive for my first layer of dirt texture. This is mostly because it's a good dark colour, so when we come to applying some more dirt texture over the top, it's going to leave us with a few shadows in the darker recesses of the landscape. And for my second layer of texture, I apply some finely sieved dirt from my garden, mixed in with some brown tile grout. I repeated this step across the whole piece before locking everything down with some more IPA and scenic cement. Then everything was put to one side so it had a few hours to dry. And in the meantime, I could then start work on the trestle bridge. I started by cutting a strip of balsa wood into smaller pieces that were roughly about the right size that I needed. Then I just lined everything up and glued in a few supports where needed. Then I fashioned a makeshift jig out of XPS foam just to ensure that I got a good right angle under the pieces that were going to support the track. Then after adding in a couple more supports, I could offer it up to the landscape and double check how much material I needed to remove from the bottom. Then I double checked my fit and repeated the same steps for the other side. Once I'd made the really tough decision on what colour to paint the supports, I went ahead and gave them both a good base coat. Then the next step was to give the supports an aged look with a silver grey dry brush. And for that added extra detail, I used some matte mod podge and some green foam flock to create some moss. Then I added a dark green wash over the top, just to give the moss that little bit more depth. Then it was on to one more test fit before gluing the supports in place and adding a little of that foam flock to the riverbed. Then came the next job on the list, and that was to fit the track. But before I could do that, it needed to be weathered. So I started by giving it a good uniform coat of primer, and then a base coat with a mix of a couple of brown tones. Then it was just a light dry brush with a beige colour, followed by a dark grey wash for the sleepers, and a rusty brown wash for the rails. Then I marked out the sleepers that needed to be removed, and cut them away using a sharp hobby blade. I don't claim to be an intelligent man, but I had a bit of a big brain moment when it came to trying to bend the track. 
I thought that using a couple of bricks that I had left over from a recent gardening project would allow me to keep each end of the track reasonably straight while I concentrated on bending the middle. And as it turns out, my brain and my muscles are probably not as big as I thought. I guess in my head, this was probably a better way of getting a more consistent bend rather than just brute forcing it. But sometimes a pair of pliers and a little bit of tough love is all you need. So once I had the track fitted, I could then move on to adding some ballast to each end. So after masking off the ends just to keep that consistency, I sprinkled over my ballast and brushed it into place. Then when I was happy, I used a little bit of watered down matte mod podge to lock it all down. At this point, it was ready to start having vegetation added. And the first thing I wanted to model was some roots. And to do that, I use some roots. These are just natural roots that I've picked from my garden and left for a while to dry out. All it takes is a little bit of matte bob podge just to hold them in place. So once I was happy that the real roots looked like real roots, I could move on to adding some static grass. I put down a layer of matte mod podge before sprinkling over a layer of spring green grass from WWS. And because this is an engaged diorama, I made sure to keep the lengths between 2 and 3 mil. Then when that first layer was dry, I applied some more glue to some random patches and then applied some more lengths to create some random tufts. The grass was then finished off with a few random tones of flock and some scale leaves before being locked into place with some watered down white glue. And while I was waiting for all of that to dry, it was as good a time as any to tidy up the sides with some black gesso. One of the main features in this scene was the fast moving white water, and if I'm honest, I had no idea how I was going to model this. I've made my fair share of scenes involving water in the past with varying results, but I've never really had to make anything with water that's moving this fast. But I thought a good place to start would probably be to try and create some small waterfalls. So I cut a few strips of plastic packaging into an appropriate shape and placed them over the top of the rocks before locking them in place with a little bit of UV resin. Then I could prep for my first resin pour by using some more of the plastic packaging as a barrier. I sealed this all in with some more UV resin just to make sure it was extra watertight. I'm going to be using this shallow pour crystal clear resin from Ink Lab. This stuff's pretty good and it only really takes about 16 to 18 hours to cure. It's just a case of mixing it to a 1 to 1 ratio and then tinting it with some resin safe pigments. I went with a couple of drops of sky blue and a drop of fluorescent green to give me a nice turquoise colour. Then it was time to pour and I really concentrated on not blocking the view of the camera with a big blue glove. But once I had that first layer down and I'd pushed some resin into all the gaps, I could come along and pop some of the bubbles with my butane torch. Then the next day, when the resin had completely cured, I could then come in and start to remove the barriers. I did have some UV resin that didn't quite cure properly, but that wasn't too much of a problem. I just cleaned it up using a little bit of IPA and then touched up the paint. At this point, I was ready to start fumbling my way through making some white water. And I decided the best thing to do would be to treat it like every other aspect of the diorama and build it up in layers. So I started by applying some acrylic white paint on the end of a sponge and an old brush in the areas I wanted the most movement out of the water. And then I could start to build up that water with some more UV resin. I just tried to manipulate the resin into the shapes that I wanted as it was curing with the torch. 
And because I ended up using quite a lot of resin and I wanted to make sure it definitely cured, I had to pull out the big guns. Then it was on to creating another layer of water effects. And this time I wanted to try something new. This is baking powder mixed in with a little bit of gloss mod podge. And because baking powder is a rising agent and used in things like cakes and bread, when you mix it all together, you get this pretty cool little reaction. And it's this reaction that produces this nice fluffy white look, which I thought would be perfect for modeling the next layer of white water. I just concentrated on building it up in layers with an old brush and then using a toothpick I could come in and give everything a little bit more definition. And once I was happy all those layers had some time to dry, I began with my second resin pour, this time concentrating on not getting any on the tracks. For the second pour I tinted the resin with a medium brown just to imply that the water was kicking up some dirt. Then I added in an extra piece of broken bridge support just to add that extra detail. And when that second resin pour had dried, I could come in and blend in the broken bridge support with some more of that baking powder white water. Then once I was happy, I could move on to adding the final layer, which was to create a ripple effect using some gloss mod podge. I applied a fairly thick layer across the surface of the resin and then came in with the airbrush and pushed it around to give me a nice rippled effect. And while I was waiting for all of that to dry, I could get on with making this piece really come to life. I made a whole bunch of trees off camera using some sea foam, coarse turf and some fine flock. And it was finally about time to add some more greenery to this piece. I just drilled a few holes with my pin vise before pushing the trees into place using a little bit of matte Mod Podge. This is always one of my favourite steps because you can see everything start to come together and all that hard work starts to pay off. But when I was finished with the trees, I decided there's always room for more. All these extra layers of vegetation were added in pretty much the same way as the trees. I just made a hole first and then used some matte mod podge to hold it in place. A lot of these plants and bushes are probably a little bit out of scale for this piece, but it's all I had so I decided to go with it. Then once I was happy that all of the green bits were sufficiently green, I could then finally call the base finished. But there was still one very important piece missing, and that was our brave little tram engine. So it was off to Thingiverse, where I found this great little 3D model of a J70 tram engine. Which is exactly the engine that Toby is based off of in the TV show. So after getting the files downloaded, I scaled everything correctly and got it all supported in the slicing software. And while I was at it, I also downloaded this file for a train driver, mainly because the look on her face I thought was quite appropriate. I'll pop a link down in the description for all the 3D files that I used if anyone wants to go and check them out. So once I had everything printed and cured, I then just needed to remove the supports before I could start putting everything together. And I made sure to be extra careful with that teeny tiny driver. And to make sure everything had a really nice fit, I tidied up all of the edges with a small file before moving on to making a few modifications. I don't think this file was ever intended to be printed this small. 
so as a result this thing was really delicate and to get around this I just glued in a couple of pieces of foam and some really thin card just to try and keep it that little bit more rigid. And even though this little engine was never actually going to be rolling anywhere, I thought it'd be a nice little detail to add some 3D printed wheels. Then I glued in place the world's tiniest buffer stops and the world's tiniest bell. And then he was ready for paint. And like I've said before, painting isn't my strong suit. It kind of makes me nervous. So I tried to keep this paint job as simple as possible. I started by giving everything a good coat of primer and then moving on to a highlight. And then it was on to giving everything an appropriately coloured base coat. The cab received the coat with some of Vallejo's wood and for the side plates and cow catches I used some engine grey. Then using a very light dry brush I gave all the edges a highlight. Before creating some shadows with a few washes. Then for the final step, I could come in and just pick out all the details. So the buffer beams got a nice coat of red. Then the roof was painted with a light gray and the world's tiniest bell with some antique gold. And I almost forgot the world's tiniest lamps. And then I painted the driver with a little bit of assistance because I was born in the 90s before awkwardly fixing her in place in the cab. And with that last job out of the way, I think it was finally time to move on to some glamour shots. So that's about it for this video, and as always, thanks for watching. I really appreciate each and every one of you for taking the time to check out my builds. And please go ahead and leave a comment down below because I'd love to know what you guys think. But in the meantime, I'm off to see what my little one thinks of this diorama. So as always, I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>